one of the very famous words of, of American history is that these are times that try men's souls. In the very beginning of our nation, this, this great statement and has been repeated time and time again. The truth of the matter is there haven't been any times in all of history that do not try men's souls. But we do live in difficult times. We recognize that is the case. And we need all the help that God can give to us because we are weak human beings. The Lord's Church has been a great blessing to us as families and as individuals and is a blessing for us and will be for all of eternity. But I want to talk to you today with regard to dangers that the Lord's Church faces. It has faced dangers from the very beginning. There was persecution as they took the apostles and beat them and put them in prison and threatened them. And time and again, they, whenever they got the chance, they would get out and they would continue to preach and teach the Word of God, saying we must obey God rather than men. This is still true. What we need to do today is obey God rather than men, pray that God's blessings will be upon us. God's blessings will be upon us in answer to our prayers and the providence of God that is extended to us with the great blessings that are a part of it. We live in very trying times indeed. We need to understand that God still cares about his own and is concerned about us and will do for us the things that we so desperately need. We're going to be talking about the kind of times that we face in our generation. We live in a land of Bibles, but it is unfortunate that the Bible is not read and not understood as well as it should. George Gallup, in a survey looking at how little people really know about the Bible in America, gives some revealing things. George Gallup reveals to us that only 50% only 50% of Americans know that the book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Not only that, teenagers are able to know only about three or four of the Ten Commandments and state those commandments. About 75% can name only one prophet of the Old Testament, one single prophet of the Old Testament. 34% of adults are unable to tell you who preached the Sermon on the Mount. That certainly is a, a revealing of the kind of ignorance that characterizes our day and our time. Only three out of ten can tell you what it was, what books it, were, it was, it is that gives the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Amos, the eighth chapter, in verse 11, we find it saying there with regard to the ignorance of that time, we find the Lord making the, making the point that uh, at that particular time that there is a famine, he said, in the land, not a famine of bread, or, but rather a famine of hearing of the word of God. I believe that's the case today, even though we have a great many Bibles. In our hearing just a moment ago, as we read this passage from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, it says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on what? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle again, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness in, uh, of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he goes ahead to say in that next verse, as he speaks with regard to this uh, armor that is to be put on as the Christian, he says, therefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We need to put on not just part of the armor, we need to put on all of the armor. And as it speaks with regard to this, he says, with our loins girt about with truth. That's the straps, the, the uh, leather straps around his waist that hang down. And then the breastplate of righteousness that protects the heart and the vital organs of the body. And then he is saying here, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on the helmet of salvation. Take the shield of faith. And then we're to have the sword of the Spirit, which is, the Scripture says, which is the Word of God. 
if we, do, if we put on the whole armor of God, if as Christian soldiers we're well prepared in this way, then we can face the dangers that come to us in life. If we do not, then we're not adequately protected as we should be. I want us to think with regard to some of those things that are characteristic of our day and our age. We've already talked about the matter of ignorance of God's word. As Amos said, that it, there would be a famine in the land, not of bread or of water, but of reading and hearing of the word of God. And there are a number of passages we might look at in this connection. Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. It isn't lack of academic knowledge. We are an educated, affluent group of people who are uh, well prepared for that matter, for da daily living from a stand that kind of standpoint. But the knowledge of God's word, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. He says, I will reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So many people in a land of Bibles do not read it, do not heed the teaching of it, Jesus makes the point here in John 6 and verse 45. He said, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. We need to be taught. We need to come to Christ. I'm not going to flash up 2 Timothy 2.15. Most of you are very familiar with this passage. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. And then Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 says, We do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I would rather that my children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren on down, I would rather that they learn their ABCs in heaven than to have several advanced degrees and wind up in torment. It is important for us to have spiritual understanding, to understand the word of God that Paul said to Timothy was able to save his soul. It's able to save our souls. We cannot afford to have ignorance of God's word. It is a grave danger, not only far as the nation is concerned, unfortunately with regard even to the Lord's church. All right, dangers that face the church, not only the problem of ignorance of God's word, there is a problem of compromise. Satan would like for us to compromise. Do you remember that in the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, when Satan came to tempt the Lord, after the Lord had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, we find Satan came to him and he began to attack him on, on the very things that he wanted most, first of all, food and various things. But one of the things he did, Satan recognized that Jesus came to establish a kingdom here upon this earth. He wanted to establish God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so Satan took Jesus on that high temple, or rather on that high mountain, and said, as he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, Satan said, I'll give you a kingdom in effect. Bow down and worship me, and I will give you all of these. That would short circuit what Jesus came to do. He came to establish his church, the spiritual kingdom, but Satan was willing to compromise. Always it's been true that when God's people are confronted with doing what's right, there are those who would try to get them to compromise. I think of the statement back in the book of Exodus when Moses was trying to lead God's people out of the land of Egypt that Pharaoh, who really kind of represents uh, an image of Satan, tried to get him to compromise in every way that he could. We find that uh, Pharaoh came and said, you don't need to go outside the land. You can worship here in the land. Moses said, we can't do this. Our worship would be an abomination. They had to offer animal sacrifices, which the Egyptians worshiped. And so Pharaoh offered another compromise. He says, only do not go far away. You can go, but don't go far away. They had to go three days journey into the wilderness to, to sacrifice to the Lord. And so say, if we find Pharaoh saying, well, only, only have the, the uh, 
the men go, leave the women and children at, here behind. Pharaoh knew that if they left the women and children, they'd come back. And uh, they, they said, we all have to go. And we find Pharaoh saying to him, leave your flocks and herds. Only leave your flocks and herds. The Bible says where a man's uh, possessions are, there is what? His heart also. Pharaoh knew they would. And Satan uses the same kind of compromises with regard to the Lord's church to get us not to go too far, not to be so concerned about our material possessions in, in the work of the Lord, not to do what the Lord would have us to do. We are offered compromises in so many ways, morally, spiritually, and in every way, we simply cannot afford to compromise. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Don't compromise with these things. In Galatians 2.11, we find it says, When Peter had come to Antioch, now Paul said, I withstood him to the face. Peter, the great apostle that preached that first gospel sermon, it says because he was to be blamed because before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He's going against what he knew to be right. And Paul says he was to be blamed and he withstood him to the faith. All of us need, when we are tempted to compromise, somebody who will tell us what we really need to do. And Paul, later on, we find uh, Peter saying with regard to him, speaking with regard to him as the beloved apostle Paul, he did not, he did not resent what Paul had done, but appreciated it. In Jude chapter 3, no, there's not a, tra a third chapter, it's chapter 1 and verse 3, and that's, that's how we write it in many cases. Jude, just three. It's one of those little one-chapter books of the New Testament. But Jude said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful that I should write unto you and exhort you that you contend earnestly for the faith. We should always stand for what's right. Stand up for the faith. As this passage would suggest, it is once delivered to the saints. We are to hold on to it. We're to stand with it. We are not to compromise those things that God would have us to do. So what are the dangers along the way? Ignorance, compromise. What about the problem of apostasy? Over and over again, in the New Testament, the apostles are warning with regard to falling away, going away into apostasy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. We are in grave danger when we feel like there is no danger. If we think we're standing, we need to be very, very careful lest we fall away from what God would, would have us to be and what God would have us to do. We need to be very, very careful to stand for what is right in every, every case. And we find it saying in Acts chapter 20 to the Ephesian elders, Paul says, he says to them, take heed unto yourself, to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Because he says, I know that there will be those who will come in teaching damnable doctrine to draw away disciples after themselves. He's warning against apostasy, the danger of apostasy, and we need to stand right with those things that the Lord commands. Here's the passage it says in Hebrews 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. One can be a believer and he can become an unbeliever and depart from the living God. And the great warning of Paul to young Timothy, he says, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. So over and over again, the danger of apostasy, warning against these things, it would happen if you look at history exactly as these apostles and the Holy Spirit warned that it would, it continues to happen over and over again as there are those who fall away. God help us to restore them to the right way by using the scriptures to bring people back into a right relationship with God. But we have to see the dangers. 
before we can avoid the dangers. Not only ignorance, compromise, and apostasy, but also the problem of neglect. Statement in Hebrews, you find here Paul saying, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Dropping down in the verse, this verse, he says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? It is easy for us, if we're not very careful, to neglect the things that are very, very important in life. In Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 30 beginning, we find the wise men of Israel saying, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. It was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And he goes ahead to say that the wall was broke. What was the problem? It was because of neglect. The individual saying, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. That's true physically. It's also true spiritually. We simply cannot afford to neglect God's word. We need to study it. We need to know the truth of God. We need to do what God would have us to do. And so uh, we need to be careful in, in this regard. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, talking about materialism, it says that he that fell among thorns, this is the parable of the sower, he that fell among thorns, I lost a letter there on that, that, not hat that fell on thorns, but uh, that fell on thorns, are they which, when they heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Thorns in a garden, weeds can come up and choke the plants that you want to grow there, and that's true spiritually also. The Lord is saying that the sower went forth to sow, some fell on the wayside soil that was hard, some fell on rocky soil, some fell on good soil. But here's that, that thorny soil with the thorns and thistles and those things that choked out, they choked out the Word of God. Materialism is that kind of thing. The riches and pleasures of this life, the cares and riches and pleasures. Most of the time we think of we think of pleasures as something that's always good. It's not always good. It can choke out the Word of God as well as our worries and cares and the difficulties the thing, of the things that come to us in life along that line. And as we think about material prosperity, there's a great deal to be concerned about. Our country has been blessed in such wonderful ways, but it has not made us more spiritual people. And so Paul, speaking along this line, says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world. It is certain that we can carry nothing out, and that having food and raiment, we ought to be content. They that would be rich. One doesn't have to be rich to let riches choke out their spirituality. The person who just is so concerned about materialism, so concerned about making money, they didn't have time to come to church, doesn't have time to study the Bible, doesn't have time to be interested in spiritual things. They that would be rich, he says, fall into temptation, a stare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. We need to understand that there are other things that bring evil into the hearts of people, but the love of money is a root not only of evil, but all kinds of it. Materialism is a dangerous thing, but moving on. One of the great problems of the Lord's church is, is indifference and apathy. In 12, the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew says, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me is scattered. One cannot be indifferent. He can't straddle the fence, so to speak. We're either for the Lord or we are against the Lord. There was a church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. A church there that thought that it was rich and had need of nothing. And we find the Lord saying that they were poor and wretched and miserable and blind. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot, because Thou art lukewarm. 
neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. When one comes up out of the watery grave of baptism, first a Christian, he is so enthusiastic and so appreciative that he has his sins forgiven, he is really on fire for the Lord. But somehow there, there's a tendency for us to cool down and to become rather apathetic and indifferent. And if we're not very careful to fall away from what God would have us to be, it is a danger an ever-present danger that we need to be aware of as we talk about the dangers that faces the Lord's church. And then there's boastfulness. The Lord talks about this. We find him condemning those who want to brag about what they are doing and being boastful about their work. We're told not to let the left hand know what the right hand does. First of all, let's look at James chapter 4, though. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. We are not to be the kind of people that brag about our spirituality and our, our giving and the things that we do in the service of the Lord. We need to be humble about the things that, that we face. Here in Matthew chapter 6 it says, But take care not to do your good works before men to be seen of them. They have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. We are not to sound a trumpet before us when we go out into the street. We're not to pray long prayers. We're not to be people that are pride, full of pride and boastfulness. We need to be humble before the Lord. These are things that can cause us to stumble along life's way. And I have one more point in this connection. And there, of course, is the problem of false doctrine. There were problems with false doctrine in New Testament times. There are still problems with false doctrine in the day and age in which we live. We need to recognize that we must stand for the truth. We must stay with the Word of God. We're not to add to or take from those things that God has written. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. There are some people, like those people at Athens who were always looking for some new thing and get, get so excited about something that's new, the Bible teaches that we are not to add to or take from Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. We cannot add to God's word. The plagues that are written in this book will be added to us. If we take away from it, our part out of the holy city will be taken. We are not to change it. That's been true all along the way. Way back in the beginning of the Old Testament, it says, Thou shalt not add to the words which I command thee this day, neither shalt thou diminish aught therefrom. We are not to change God's word. False doctrine adds to it. It's something that's new and exciting, and many people grab a hold of that kind of thing. It is extraordinarily dangerous. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1 and 2, we find it saying, Therefore, my son, to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's what the church is all about. We are to preach the gospel to the entire world. Not just the preaching of the gospel with regard to the first principles, but then we find the Lord said, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. We need to teach all things. We need to preach the gospel. The Bible also teaches that we have the responsibility as we do this to commit unto, commit unto others the things that, they, that we have received. We are committed to faithful men. The School of Preaching is busily engaged in trying to find faithful men who would be good teachers and preachers of the gospel of Christ and then to teach them, to imbibe them with all of these things that they need to know to teach God's word in order to promote the advancement of the cause and kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When the Lord gave the commission, and gave those words that said, Teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The end of the earth, the end of the age. The Lord will be with us all along the way. The question is whether we will continue faithful with him. 
be what God would have us to be. There's not only the importance of obeying the gospel and becoming a Christian, there is the importance of being faithful unto death. Dangers facing the church. We talked about all of these things. God help us to be able to hear him say, one day, when we come to the end of the way, that we have been faithful, enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Some will hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so the question today for all of us, where do we stand? It's not a matter of whether or not we have been Christians in the past. Are we faithful Christians today? If not, we need to make our lives right in the sight of God. If we have neglected, if we have fallen into apostasy, if we have drifted away from what God would have us to be, we ought to come back. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you ought to do it today. One day, it will be too late. Time will have passed, and you will no longer have the opportunity. Why not today come to Christ upon the terms of the gospel? We sing the song of invitation to give you an opportunity to express your will. You can come fa forward and tell us that you'd like to be baptized into Christ, and we will be thrilled to help you in that way. If as a Christian you need to return to your Lord, to be forgiven, the Bible teaches that we are to pray together, and we'd be so happy to pray together with you as you repent of the mistakes of the past and to be right with our God at this point. If you need to come, do it now as together we stand and as we sing.